Uh, hello, everybody. We're just going to get started. You can uh, continue getting your food, no rush there. Um, my name is Gabriel Wilgen. I'm the co-president of the Harvard Law School Animal Law Society. Um, on behalf of our co-partners at the Food Law Society, um, the uh, Food Law and Policy Clinic, uh, Effective Altruists, uh, the DOS Grant Fund, and the Petrie Flom Center, I'd like to uh, welcome you all. Um, I also want to thank our outgoing board members uh, who are graduating 3L, who are here, our, our co-president and our, really our true president this year, uh, Kate Bernico, uh, Sarah Rechtenwald, and Amy Chow. I don't know if she's here. But, oh, hey, Amy. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time. Yeah. This is our, our last talk for the year, so last time that they'll be here as students, but hopefully we'll be visiting again uh, later on. Um, so I'm here today to introduce to you our, our final speaker of the year, uh, Professor Christine Parker, uh, who is a professor of law at the University of Melbourne, Australia, and a visiting fellow here at the Harvard Law School Animal Law and Policy Program. Um, professor Parker's research on the politics of higher welfare food lab labeling has been published in a range of Australian and international legal and socio-legal journals. Uh, her co-authored paper on the insidious impact of misleading health, sustainability, and fair trade claims on superfood products in uh, is forthcoming in the Journal of Food Law and Policy, and she's currently developing a new project on the possibilities for regulatory governance to help create a transformed relationship with animals and ecosystems in the food system. And before I bring her up, I just want to also remind you that there's going to be a paper going around for sign-ups. If you've already signed up, no need to sign up again. Um, and also, I think I might have failed to also thank, of course, our, one of our greatest partners all year long, um, the Harvard uh, Animal Law and Policy Program, and Chris Green and all his help. Uh, so everybody, please welcome the Professor Christine Parker. Thanks, Gabriel. Um, just get that out of the way. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, good day. Okay, it's uh, Melbourne. It's not Melbourne. I always have to get that right at the beginning. Um, so thank you very much to um, the Animal Law and Policy Program who've been hosting me here um, as a fellow this term um, and to the Student Animal Law Society for hosting this talk. Um, I've been having a fantastic time and enjoying all the talks, which I've learned so much from. So I'm going to talk about um, the research that I have more or less completed in Australia um, and do a little bit of comparison with the US at the end on the basis of what I've gleaned while I've been here. Um, so my research focuses on the idea that we can enlist the consumer as a governance agent. So I love this ad that's up here at the moment. Um, it's obviously advertising the idea of buying fair trade products and making the claim really clearly um, that you can do good while you shop. So it's very attractive because it suggests that we as individuals have agency, we can change the world, um, but it also makes a democratic governance claim if you look at it carefully. It suggests that via our shopping in the marketplace, um, we can make different voices heard and somehow create a fundamental shift of power in the global market. It also implies, if you think about it, that even though the government is um, not effective, um, so you know governments can't govern these global markets effectively, it implies that somehow a partnership between business and a social movement for fair trade can make a difference to the way that the world works and the experience of the poorest in society. Um, so it's making a claim about voice, I think, of different stakeholders, different values in the market system, and it's making a claim about impact, the fact that this will actually change the market. And this is a very powerful narrative in our world, um, and it's a policy idea that comes up over and over again, especially when we're talking about the food system. So I'm going to unpack that claim in the context of food labelling and especially animal welfare. Um, and there may be a brief detour into superfood labelling if we have enough time. So why food? 
So we all have to eat every day. So um, food is great. It's everything. It's culture. It's um, personal. It's social. It's health. It's ethics. It's justice. It's also globalised. And it's also something where every single day, one way or another, we have to interface with um, the market. Um, so that's why I decided to start looking at food. Um, food labelling I'm defining very broadly here, um, and this is actually the legal definition that applies pretty much everywhere because it comes from the Codex Alimentarius, which is the international um, treaty to do with food. Um, and it's food labelling is all the tags, brands, marks, statements, representations, designs and description made on food and its packaging and made or displayed to consumers when it's sold. Okay, that's a legal definition. Um, but basically what it means is a food label in law and also in my analysis is everything that's made or displayed to the consumer at the time that it's sold. So that could be, that's the, pa the little label that you know of on the package. It could be the menu. It could be stuff on the shelves. Um, it could be online, all those claims and so on when you go to your online health food store or whatever. And food labelling in this broad sense has been the concern of, of law um, since the beginnings of codified law and probably beforehand. So what I've got there actually is a picture of an ancient Roman bread brander um, where they would always stamp that on the bread before it was baked. It was a marketing thing so that you knew which baker made your bread and you could go back if you liked it. But it's also a food safety measure because if the food was contaminated, they could then go back and, I don't know, feed that guy to the lions or whatever they used to do in those days. Um, so um, it includes... Um, so we've had law since ancient times um, mandating certain information on um, food, dates, allergen warnings and codifying food descriptions um, and also regulating misleading labelling. And then, as um, you would all know, in the context of nutritional labelling in particular, um, the, this legality around labelling has become more and more important. Um, so labelling is nutritional labels are put forward as a form of um, infrastructure to give information to the consumer and to indirectly regulate or nudge um, the consumer and, and the market. So that's so it's a very fruitful area on for research on the relationship between law or public regulation, private um, standards and governance by businesses, um, and the everyday way that we interact with this market. Um, and especially so these days in um, the brand of neoliberal capitalism that we have now where we tend to favour indirect informational and market-based regulation and that's often all that seems um, possible. Okay, so, um, so in the context of um, the growth of processed and packaged food, supermarket <coughs> concentration and quality claims on food, we're all interacting with these food labels all the time. Um, and I want to suggest that we should read these labels um, in two different ways. In one way, um, they're what one um, food studies writer called an icon. So they encapsulate a certain narrative about the food's qualities, about the supply chain that produced it and transported it to us and what it means for us as consumers. So it's trying to tell us a story to foster our trust in this um, distant food chain um, and attract customers. And then we can critically examine that to see, you know, is how truthfully does it um, do that or what's it concealing and what's it revealing in doing that. So it's an icon. Um, but it's also a device. It's trying to get us to do something. It's trying to activate our values, our emotions, our ethics, 
Um, so it's not just this thing sitting there transparently telling us what's in that package. It's also trying to get us to do something, but not just us, it's also doing something backwards through the supply chain in the market. It's trying to um, standardise the information that is um, provided coordinate the information um, and it can create or close off markets, it can create new market niches, new types of products and new consumers to go with them. So that's why we have battles over things like how a fat or a sugar or a carbohydrate should be allowed to be put on that um, nutritional fact label or whether something should be um, labelled GMO or bioengineered. So for any of us who are interested in law and regulatory governance, um, then I think it's very useful to look at the label as a governance space and a contested governance space. So that was really the idea that got my research going. Um, so it's the visible manifestation of decisions about how to organise um, the food system that are occurring both backwards and forwards through from the label. So backwards in the supply chain and forwards in terms of trying to tell you what you should and shouldn't eat or buy. So I came to this topic because I had a long-term concern with um, corporate governance and accountability and I got a bit sick of the work that I was doing trying to look at how business regulation was implemented and whether business complied or not. And I thought this is a good way to look at a whole um, market where there's business regulation may be failing but social movements are trying to do something to get something on a label to change a market and my question was okay well what difference does it make um, and so I've put I've put my research question in a rather technical way there um, but really it comes down to two things so my question is a question <coughs> about voice, do these, all these labels that we have all these arguments about, whether it's health or environment or animal welfare, do they in some way give voice to different values and stakeholders within the food system? Is it a way of expanding the accountability and the democratic governance of the uh, marketised food system? Um, so voice, and the second one is impact. Does it actually make a difference to what foods are produced and how they're produced? Um, uh, if you're an economist, you could say, does it make a difference to the externalities of the food system? Um, and I think this is a central question for anyone who's interested in business regulation, is how can we constrain the market and the commodification in the market to fit within ethical, ecological and social boundaries? Um, and so my argument is that looking at food labels is a very interesting um, and powerful way that we could all do every day to think about that question. Okay, so that's the setup. That's why I think this is important for a whole range of areas. And now I'm going to talk about um, the case study um, that we've uh, focused on um, with my colleagues, Georgi Scrinis and Rachel Carey in Australia. Um, so we've done, uh, we were lucky to get uh, government funding to do a three-year uh, socio-legal empirical project on animal welfare labelling in Australia. And the reason um, that was a particularly good case, or one reason that was a particularly good case study is because it's a huge thing in Australia. Um, so um, we now have um, about half of uh, the eggs that you see in cartons in supermarkets are free range, uh, labelled free range. Um, most of the pork, ham and bacon is labelled sow stall free um, and uh, chicken meat 
um, the majority is now got a higher welfare label, RSPCA approved, and another up to a quarter is um, free range. And this has become very pervasive. Um, and But there's also been a lot of public discussion about it and a lot of action between different actors, as I'll explain in a moment. So it's an interesting case study because something's happened, essentially. Um, but it's also an important case study because it's as absolutely clear as I don't need to persuade you folk that it's a complete ethical travesty the way that um, our um, economic system commodifies living beings in um, confined animal operations, and I'm focusing on pigs and chickens um, in, in um, this study. And it also raises the challenge um, of the need to radically change um, the way our animals are used in our food system to address a whole lot of issues around health and the environment and so on. So it, um, I think it's a good case study both in, in its own terms and also for its um, ethical um, health and environmental relevance. Okay, so what did we do in our research? Um, so we essentially took seriously the idea that a conscientious consumer uh, might be able to use these labels to somehow change the food system. And we just took it to a sort of academic level of rigorousness in our methodology. So we started with what we call a visual sociology of marketing claims, which meant we went around to a, a sample of supermarkets and actually figured out what was being sold, how much of each product, what claims were being made and so on. Um, we then tracked back what, what did those claims mean. Um, and so that partly is, that was about how those claims were created. Why did they appear? Why did the supermarket decide to have products with free range on them? Who was saying that this was free range? What legal standards were there for how production was happening? What standards of any contract, legal, whatever, cases were there around what these claims actually meant? So the we call that the governance network behind these labels. Then um, we also collected 30 years of newspaper articles of discussion on animal welfare in relation to these animals and particularly looked at how the conditions about the animals, the campaigning and also discussions about labelling. So they were all coded um, and we've got all that data sitting there. Then um, we tried to understand um, what the impact of these labels were. So we had more done a um, survey of what we could see in the supermarkets, but then we also tried to sluice around to figure out, well, actually how much of the market does this actually represent? So industry data and um, so on. And then finally, of course, what does it actually mean for those animals? Um, um, so I've called that production impact there so that included um so we, uh, we did a number of interviews and we did go into um uh farms and and so on and i guess uh, we didn't have much luck getting into any um very large scale um operations but we did manage to talk to people from some of those organizations um okay so i'll describe our findings so the first question was about voice um, so does labelling, um, does this ethical labelling expand the voices and values governing the food system? So, of course, the idea is that um, what's going on is that um, social movements are trying to get, use these, are trying to get the producers to put these labels on the product so that the ethical consumers will buy the higher welfare product um, or, um, or not buy any product and then somehow that is supposed to then change um, production practices but it is also supposed to change, we argue, the governance network um, behind those production practices. So if you think about it, if this is going to work, it has to work 
because there are some sort of standard behind that label claim. So the supermarket would have to be, say, requiring the, the producer do a certain thing. So that all has to be specified, it has to be monitored and enforced and so on. So what we're trying to do um, as consumers, when we buy these products, we argue, um, is if we want to change the food system, we have to change perhaps the business-to-business -business standards, the labelling and certification claims. And ultimately, of course, I think what we want to do is by doing that, put pressure on government um, to change the baseline regulatory standards or, you know, somehow or other change the whole baseline for a whole market so that it becomes taken for granted that you do business this way. Um, so hopefully, you know, that's my regulatory governance question. Um, so um, this is a very schematic diagram of um, what happened with all these labels in Australia and who was participating in the conversation and so on. Um, so firstly, I probably just need to tell you about Australia. So farm animal welfare does come under state animal protection laws. They're all pretty much the same. Um, all the states get together. We have something we call cooperative federalism in a whole lot of areas. So we all get together and then we come up with um, common standards. So what's happened in Australia is we have these common um, model codes for um, animal farming and they're um, ostensibly science-based and independent and so on, but in fact industry captured and so they um, facilitate industrial farming and allow all the normal cruel practices like cages for hens and sow stalls and tail docking and all those sort of things. Um, and they're incorporated into law one way or another in um, most of the states. Um, uh, also, I just need to tell you, we have no imports of fresh meat into Australia or eggs or anything. So um, we don't have a, the problem of competition. We, if we want to do something, if we want to have higher standards, we can. Um, um, so what did we find? So we found that there was constant activism by the animal movement, um, several age organisations. Um, who were very dissatisfied with both the standards and also the governance process for these standards. Um, but, and between 2000 and 2010, um, as some of you may be aware, in the European Union, they made a number of big changes in their animal welfare regulation based on um, their better system really for science and community values based animal welfare regulation and in each case the animal movement got on board with that in Australia and said hey EU is banning cages why don't we do that and our government said okay yeah we'll look at it so you know social pressure EU yeah um, we're still a bit British uh, and every time our government said no, we're not going to do that, too expensive for industry, but we're going to encourage the industry to do labelling for consumer choice instead. Okay, so what did, so what that meant was, A, there was an opportunity for discussion about these things, but government said we're not going to do anything, but we're going to encourage the industry to do it. Surprise, surprise, industry didn't really do very much more, or they didn't really, they basically just kept doing the same thing, but added some labels. Um, and so when it became clear that this was the scenario, we've got two supermarkets that dominate about 80% of the packaged grocery market in Australia, Coles and Woolworths. We call them Colesworths. Um, and when it became clear that nothing much was happening from the government end, Coles and Woolworths looked over to Europe and said, uh-oh, you know, we're going to get Aldi and um, other, and we're going to get Costco from America coming in and competing with us. But in Europe, um, some of the supermarkets have taken on all these ethical and quality labels to try and... Um, uh, build consumer loyalty. Um, so that's a good idea. So they hired in people from the UK um, to help them build their ethical brands and animal welfare was a huge part of that. So our two supermarkets both promised to get rid of cages for eggs. 
Um, and eventually they also promised to get rid of sow stalls for pigs. Um, you call them gestation crates, I think. And um, uh, they also to increase um, standards for uh, meat chickens. Um, and so that's how we got to that situation I told you about where we now have um, quite a lot of them market in these higher, slightly higher welfare systems. Um, so this was due to the supermarkets thinking about their own brand and in order to do that they needed to build alliances um, to some degree with both animal movement and um, uh, industry. So um, if you think about it, it's perfectly logical, the animal movement felt that it had really no choice but to encourage consumers um, to buy as kindly as possible. So even the quite reasonably radical um, animal movement um, in, you know, across the spectrum, um, Animals Australia, so it's sort of, well, I, I won't go into, the, I guess there are more radical ones, but in terms of the three main sort of ones, that's the more radical one. So they um, have this long run vote with your trolley um, campaign. So they're campaigning against factory farming, but they're also essentially encouraging people to buy higher welfare. They also encourage people to go meat free if they can, but they're doing, you know, they're sort of, they've got a stage thing. And so you even see there in that previous slide, um, that was um, had a shopping bag at Coles, um, thanking Coles for taking on higher animal welfare standards. So quite explicit um, alliance. Um, and you see there also RSPCA, which is the more, um, the less radical one. They actually have a set of standards for higher welfare um, products and um, the, supermarket took, the supermarkets took that on for meat chicken. Um, so you can probably already guess from what I've said that that, that will also involve some compromise. Um, the supermarkets also needed, of course, to get the industry on board because they couldn't provide these higher welfare products unless industry had um, processes and standards to do that and they need a lot of supermarkets require a lot of certifications and monitoring and, and so on. Um, so that also happened. Okay, so um, what you see here is that as the supermarkets took on these high welfare products, we saw a lot more discussion of these um, terms in our newspaper articles. And so the big line there, the blue line, that is discussion of free range eggs in, um, in newspaper articles between 2000 and 2016. Um, and you see it goes, way up after about 2010, 2011, when the supermarkets took on um, the idea of cage-free eggs. And then the other two are um, for sow stalls and meat chickens. And the free-range egg one, it, that was just huge. So it kind of dwarfs the others. But if I gave you separate graphs, you'd see it's even still quite dramatic for the other products. And so we did analysis of these um, newspaper articles and so th this is huge. This is any, ask any Australian, there's been a lot of discussion about this stuff. Um, and it was, we've dis we coded the composition of who was discussing this stuff. So pre the, which, which stakeholders were mentioned. So previously we used to have articles about animal activists campaigning against cages and industry and the Ministry of Agriculture saying, you know, they're bad, no, we can't ban cages. But now we have consumer organisations, um, Greens MPs, um, restaurant, you know, we have a much broader range of people discussing this. So it becomes much more of a public discourse. Um, and in particular, um, as a consumer issue, so a consumer labelling issue, not just um, an animal agriculture issue. Um, and so um, um, we had, um, and so 
our consumer organisation choice, which is a bit like your consumer reports that publish a magazine and so on, very similar. Um, they took on animal welfare labelling and so did our consumer and competition um, regulator, our federal one, which is similar to your FTC. Um, and they took a series of cases against misleading labelling um, in all three of, for all three of those animals that we've been, that I've mentioned, so pigs, hens and um, chickens. The first one was meat chickens. They took successful action against um, claims. Uh, an advertising campaign the industry ran with all the main producers that meat chickens were free to roam, which was meant to counteract the thought, the uh, mis um, misconception that people have that meat chickens are in cages. Um, but they found that was they argued that was misleading because it gave the impression they were actually out, you know, in nature somewhere, which they weren't. They were crowded into barns. Um, then a series of cases around free-range eggs, um, first on substitution, so cage eggs being sold as free-range, and then on the actual conditions in which the hens were kept and whether they could really get out of the barn or not. Um, and also um, some cases on bread free range, which were, uh, the pig people had a campaign about, which was um, uh, where the sows, the mother pigs, are out on the range, but the piglets are kept inside until they grow up and get made into ham or bacon or whatever they get made into. Um, and, and that was also found to be misleading. Um, and I think there was also a, a bit of an action on sow stall free, which I'll talk about in a moment. Okay, so we have, um, oh, sorry, we went forward. Um, so we had that consumer, we had a lot of um, consumer action. Um, okay, so what was the impact? Um, so I'm interested in the impact on the market, the network of governance and on animals' lives. And I've got a bit of a summary here. So basically the headline is um, an, a small incremental improvement um, for the majority of animals. Um, I'm an optimist, so I think it probably will eventually get put into our animal welfare standards, um, but it's not yet. It's because of the supermarkets that it, these, these small incremental improvements are covering a majority of the animals. Um, so what that means is now for pigs, the majority are sow stall free, but you know they're still in mating stalls and farrowing crates and they're still in big sheds and it's still basically the same system. It's just not quite as absolutely awful as being in a crate for, your, for the whole pregnancy. Um, uh, meat chickens, um, so now the majority are RSPCA approved, which is basically the regulatory standard with some enrichment and a couple of um, bales of hay for them to jump on. So essentially before um, it wasn't very well regulated, whereas now the RSPCA is actually checking that they're doing the right thing in the supermarket because the supermarkets told them they have to. So again, a small improvement. Um, and then eggs, uh, we, well, we've actually got a lot of variation in eggs now because that's been such a huge public issue, um, but it's essentially what I call industrial free range. So they're still in great big barns and they can get out, but um, uh, it's onto a bare range. So it's not really what people think of when they think of free range, um, if they've got that sort of pastoral romantic ideal in their mind. Um, and the other thing that I want to point out is that, okay, so a small improvement for the majority of animals because of the supermarket's actions, but more animals being farmed. Cons production and consumption just keeps going up. So um, really important to remember that because, um, you know, if we think the, the biggest problem really with the food system in Western countries anyway is overproduction and overconsumption in terms of environment and health, then, you know, that's a problem and it's also a problem for animal welfare because, you know, even if you accepted the idea that you could have very high animal welfare standards, it would have to be with a much smaller number of animals. 
um, in order to make that in any way realistic. Um, okay, so what about the potential for ongoing improvement? Did it change? So um, my thought is, well, you know, maybe we can accept small incremental improvements if they lock in further incremental improvements. Maybe there's some way that this can go forwards. Um, so I'm not particularly optimistic about this at this point, unfortunately. Um, but in my research, I'm trying to think about, well, what could, what could we do to be more optimistic about that? But I just, so I just want to raise a couple of um, points um, about what the problems with this are. So, what the, so the first problem is that what this um, network did was really give the power to the supermarkets to define what animal welfare is because government said no, we're not going to do anything. Um, so animal consumers and animal movements said go to the supermarket and, def and demand higher welfare and the supermarket said yeah we'll do that, that's great, but you know that means you'll love us more and keep coming back to us. Um, and then um, the industry sort of had come up with ver these various higher welfare labels and the consumers, the animal groups, the consumer movement all said, no, they're misleading. So they went to, um, as I said, um, to the consumer protection agency and got and knocked out all those industry labels. So all the sort of self-regulatory industry labels got legally knocked out by misleading and deceptive advertising um, enforcement action. So the only people left standing with sort of real power to create standards is the supermarkets. So if we go back here, what we find is um, the supermarkets have posited themselves as the authoritative judge um, of how to balance convenience for consumers, price and ethical qualities and we could also add health um, and so on because it's the same if you look at nutritional labelling and um, environmental labelling and packaging and all these things. Um, and so what you see there is, um, so Curtis Stone who I think he's actually originally Australian um, and he's the Coles sort of um, celebrity chef face. So he's advertising there the higher welfare RSPCA approved um, meat chicken because it is, tastes better um, and it's at no added cost to you. So yes, it's higher welfare, but it also has to fit into these other frames as well. Um, and then you've also got the quote there from Coles where they came in on the debate over what free range means and took what the um, small scale agroecological farmers said and what the animal movement said and the consumer movement said, which was, you know, it has to be small scale, 1,500 per hectare or less and so on. And the industry had said it can be 20 or 30,000 per hectare and in big barns. And Cole said, oh, well, we're a fair judge of that. So we'll just make it 10,000 per hectare. So it's, that's the scenario that um, we're left with. And I think um, it really just locks in that sort of incremental movement within this um, overproduction um, sort of system. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to... So I think that... Um, it's no surprise to hear me say I think that uh, we need higher uh, government standards for animal welfare regulation. But I think also another way of thinking about this might be, so we got a sort of bit of power by forum shifting from animal welfare regulation to consumer protection regulation in the sense that it knocked out some of the industry standards. But I wonder whether another way of thinking about this would be to do another forum shift to holistic food policy that, and environmental policy that takes into account um, the need to change the food system and the way that we use animals in the food system. So that's what I'm working on now. Um, so I won't say much more about that because 
I haven't got it all figured out yet, but I did want to just make a couple of comments about how this differs or is the same as the US um, and because I'd like your feedback. Um, so I think once you've done this sort of mapping of a network and how the different actors interact with each other to create what the sort of standard practices are, it then becomes a, a lot easier and also quite fruitful to look at what's happening in other countries. Um, so here in the US, my quick comments are, I think um, the ballot question bans that have occurred in a number of states here have ended up having a similar effect to our supermarket bans in Australia. So they're better in the sense that they actually increase the law. So that's great. Um, but um, really their main effect is the sales bans, which then create a de facto ban on, say, cage eggs in the big producer states. And I think that sort of ends up similar to the supermarket bans because it sort of comes down to the same thing. The animal advocacy organisations have to sort of go out and ask for something achievable and that tends to be, okay, no cages or no gestation crates. It can't really be the holistic um, transformation um, of the whole relationship with animals in the food system or industrial farming of animals. Um, secondly, I think as my observation is that um, the supermarkets in the US haven't taken on the same role that the supermarkets in Australia have. That's because the supermarkets in Australia are very concentrated, uh, so they've got the power to do that. Um, but I think the food service and fast food restaurants in the US have done more so, McDonald's and Compass and, and so on. So they're using their procurement standards to try and in, um, uh, maintain uh, brand loyalty, legitimacy, social license. Um, there, um, and there are some slightly hopeful um, ideas there in the sense that I think some of the, that movement on procurement standards can be a little bit more deliberative and accountable and responsive, but probably on the whole, it ends up pretty much the same as the supermarkets. Um, you know, in Australia, Coles and Woolworths decide how much animal welfare, and I guess McDonald's decides pretty much the same thing here, and then that has an impact on the rest of the market. Um, um, and then, uh, yes, yeah, a lot, um, I, I won't, there's a lot more happening on alternative protein here, so that's got some good and bad aspects, good, probably good for animals, but probably creates some other labelling issues um, around health issues and so on that um, may become problematic later on. Um, okay, and then I wanted to say something about the EU and the UK because there's just a couple of developments there that I think are useful to think about. So obviously in the EU they have uh, at the EU level, they do have some, uh, or have had, I should say, some public um, agencies that value independent animal welfare science a lot more than in either the US or Australia. So they do have independent animal welfare scientists who aren't um, paid by industry, uh, which I think we don't have so much of, or well, we barely have in Australia and probably not so much in the US. Um, and so that means um, some standards have been promulgated that are higher than in Australia or the US. They also measure community values, um, including on animal welfare, and that is supposed to feed into regulation making. And most importantly, I think out of that more independent animal welfare science, there's a campaign going on at the EU level and among the animal welfare science community for animal-based measures of animal welfare, as opposed to input measures, which is pretty much where we're at mostly in Australia and the US. So in Australia and the US, we're always, you know, we're talking about the housing or the management or whatever, but we're not actually measuring the experience of the animal, whereas there's a movement in the EU towards measuring the um, experience of the animal, although I think it's, whether it's going to get implemented or not is another matter. Um, and then um, 
uh, the last two points there. Um, I think a couple of the um, animal organisations have done a bit more strategic thinking around um, how to encourage better animal, animal welfare in industrial farming. Um, so the Dutch SPA, which is similar to the RSPCA um, and the SPCA here and, and so on, they have a standard. It's a little bit like the Whole Foods um, five-tier standard, but I think it's better. I think the Whole Foods standard could learn from it. It's way more independent. It's more science-based. It's more accountable. They've made themselves part of the ICL Alliance, which is a regulator of labelling at the international level. So they've made themselves transparent. Um, and it also has a sort of built-in continuous improvement thing. So a slightly better way, perhaps, to think about um, standards for certification. And I think um, I, I need to look into both these things more, but I also think the Compassion in World Farming uh, from the UK work on um, rating um, companies without asking them first, so not taking payment from them, but actually just deciding we're going to rate you on how you're doing on animal welfare. And then they've been doing a lot of work on engaging with institutional investors around that and persuading investors to change their practices on that basis. And, um, and there's some interesting stuff happening in, in that area I'm trying to get. So rather than relying on supermarkets and retailers, moving it to um, ethical or responsible investment, um, which I think is promising. Okay, so um, I need to finish because we've only got a few minutes left, but um, I'll just pop up that picture because <laughs> we've got the paper on superfoods as well. Uh, and to, that's my 150-year-old husband. He eats <laughs> acai berries all the time. Um, and what I, what I really want you to take away from this talk is that, you know, we live in a, a, a market society where we sort of, we read our food. Um, and so when you're reading your food and reading your food label, think about what, what's going on in terms of the governance and accountability behind, behind that. Um, and so if you want to find out about superfoods, you can read our other paper. Great, thank you. All right, we have uh, time for a few questions. Thank you very much for that really informative talk. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions, if anybody has any. Let's wait for the microphone, please. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm wondering, it seems like part of the issue, at least in the US, can be kind of the overwhelming amount of information, that there are a lot of labels, a lot of terms. Most of them mean nothing or close to nothing. A few of them mean something, but it can be very difficult even for well-intentioned people to figure out which ones actually mean anything. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that issue? Yeah, I think, um, I think it was one of the things I had on my slide is that um, you've got a bit of a problem in the US in that you haven't been able to knock out meaningless labels like we've been able to and our consumer protection regulator has been able to and um, in Europe they're knocked out because they have to be pre-approved and that's taken seriously unlike here um, or in Australia for that matter and it seems that you actually have regulation that in a way locks in some of these meaningless regulations, um, um, you know, and organic's a great example of that because that's sort of captured. Um, so I think, I, think, um, I think it could actually still be quite useful for um, animal and consumer movements to try to knock out some of these labels with misleading advertising. Um, or whatever you call false advertising claims. Um, and, but, you know, my main point is it shouldn't be up to us to have to um, decode all these things. You know, it's just a, it's unfair and it's ineffective, essentially. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, we need to be calling for, 
proper regulation of advertising, which in my mind means a lot less claims on food and um, proper regulation of food formulation um, and production, which includes how animals are treated and a whole lot of other stuff as well. So yeah, baseline regulation. Thanks for the talk. Um, on the slide you showed with the Woolworths, um, it looked like their labeling system, it looked like it was a partnership with the RSPCA. Could you talk a little bit about what the relationship is between third party certification programs and yep. the retailer in Australia, the retailers in Australia, and how that may differ from the EU or US, and what role you think the third party certifications can play positively or negatively? Yes, yeah, so, so RSPCA, um, uh, is operates a higher uh, this RSPCA approved scheme, so it's a higher welfare labelling scheme. So they are it's Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. They come from the UK group. They are um, generally considered to be the best respected, well-known NGO in Australia. So they're just off the charts in terms of trust and legitimacy. And they also have a role in um, actually enforcing um, animal cruelty cases uh, against companion animals. So just to put that context. So, but they've always, they used to get criticised for not doing enough on farm animals. And so at the, the federal office decided to run this scheme um, and the idea of it is to incrementally improve conditions for farm animals. Um, now, they probably don't like it if I say it exactly like that, but they are actually very clear on that, that, that that's what it's there for. Um, so that's great because in a way government our government regulators do not monitor and enforce RSPC in animal welfare. RSPCA has had that role in relation to companion animals and I think this was kind of a creative way for them to do it in relation to farm animals. The problems with it are they take a percentage um, of, uh, so they basically take a commission. Um, so the products, so the supermarket requires the producers to um, do it, to put, have this accreditation for chicken meat. That means it's actually the contract growers who have to do it, so it's not the brand. So there's sort of an equity prob 